I'm going to introduce Dr. Uh, David Tahernia, um, MD, and he is going to be talking about debunking the myths behind neck and back surgery. Um, it's a great topic, um, and I think you're going to um, be well informed once we get through this presentation. He'll introduce himself and his background and his uh, role here at Eisenhower Health, and, and then we'll uh, get moving forward. Dr. Tahernia, it's all yours, sir. Great. Thanks, Brett. Yes, yeah, I'm uh, Dr. Tahernia. I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon. I've been here at Eisenhower since 2003. I'm the director of the Spine Center. Uh, I actually grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Went to medical school in Philadelphia. Did my residency in Philadelphia. Did my spine fellowship at the University of Colorado, and I completed that in 1999. And my wife and I make the Coachella Valley home. We have four kids, and we love being here. So a little bit about me. So let's move forward here. So why is back pain such a big deal, and why do we have so many people interested in this topic? Well, statistics don't lie. 80% lifetime incidence of low back pain. So basically, four out of five people will experience back pain severe enough that they will seek care for it during their lifetime. It is the number one cause of lost work days. It causes employers billions of dollars annually in lost work. And the number one musculoskeletal ailment seen by healthcare providers. So it is a big deal. So diagnosing and treating low back pain. When I came here in 2003, it was really my vision to build a comprehensive spine center. And spine is complicated enough that you really need to have a knowledge base and expertise for many different specialties. The other thing that's really exciting about spine, as opposed to some other specialties, even in orthopedics, is that it is continually evolving. And there are things I'm doing now that I didn't do five years ago. There are things I'm going to do five years from now that I'm probably not doing right now. So the, the reason why a comprehensive spine center can be successful. It's because of a shared philosophy. And that philosophy is that the majority of the spinal ailments that we see among my partners and our physician assistants and physician extenders can be treated conservatively. So we have surgeons, we have physiatry and anesthesia and pain management, we have physician assistants, and in our building alone, we have physical therapy and we have diagnostic imaging as well. So I'm the director, Dr. Faisu works with me. Dr. Smith, Kassam, and Wong are our pain management doctors. And we have another, we have a number of different physician assistants as well. So again, just a, a whole plethora of people that can communicate with you and, and evaluate you and come up with the best treatment plan for you. So when you come and you see me, for example, for a first patient visit, we're going to have you fill out a general health questionnaire. We're going to have you fill out a pain diagram, and then we'll do a history physical examination and get whatever diagnostic studies we need. The reason why I highlighted the pain diagram is that's the single most important, important information you are going to give me. And I'm gonna show you examples. So here's what the pain diagram looks like. So basically it's a body diagram where you, the body's in the front side, either the left or right side. And what I really wanna do is have you write down whether you have numbness, burning pain, stabbing pain, pins and needles, aching pain, and mark it on the part of the body where you're experiencing. Then under that body diagram, one of the most important things I want to know is, does your pain interfere with your daily activities? That's a very important but very simple question because if your quality of life is compromised and your activities of daily living are compromised, then that is a much bigger deal than just getting an occasional ache or pain. Then I also have you rate on a scale of one to 10 how bad your pain is, whether it's your back and leg, your neck or arm. And I like to know if you have a lot of pain at night too, because that may indicate other pathology. This pain diagram is a perfect example of mechanical low back pain. So this particular person filled out on the back an aching pain across the middle of the back. That typically does not need surgery. That can be treated with physical therapy, Activity modification may be bracing, injection, medication, but typically won't be a surgical problem. This pain diagram is pretty classic for someone who has pain going down the left leg or sciatic pain. And if it's a younger patient, it may be indicative that they have a herniated disc, generally L45 or L5S1. So something as simple as this pain diagram, when I see patients for the first time, may lead me down a path of the diagnosis even before the history uh, and the physical exam. This pain diagram is classic for people that have spinal stenosis. Patients that have spinal stenosis have back pain. They may have pain going down the back of both of their legs. They may have numbness or tingling in their feet. 
And one of the classic things that I ask people is the, the Costco story. Well, when you went to Costco five years ago, were you able to walk around the store without leaning on a cart? And I see a lot of people shake their heads when I give this lecture live. And then I ask them, well, what now? I mean, do you feel like you've got to lean over the cart to even make it through half the store? And that's kind of the story that you get with spinal stenosis that progresses over time. But this is a classic pain diagram for spinal stenosis. So after we have you fill out that paperwork at the general health, health questionnaire, part of the exam includes inspecting the spine, palpating the spine, a neurologic exam to see if there's any motor or sensory deficits. On occasion, if I feel that there could potentially be a different source of your leg pain, I will check your pulses. And those are various provocative maneuvers that we also employ. Diagnostic studies. So after we do the general health questionnaire, the pain diagram, the history, physical, et cetera, we do rely on diagnostic studies to help confirm what we think might be going on. And these are the common diagnostic studies that we employ. X-rays are by far the most common. MRIs and, and X-rays are probably the most common. CT scans or fancy CT scans called SPEC scans. And I'll show you an example of that. We do use EMG nerve conduction velocity studies or objective nerve studies that give us additional information. CT myelograms I typically don't use very much unless you cannot have an MRI. And I left provocative discography up here almost as kind of an anecdote. Uh, we really don't do that anymore. Years ago, we were having diagnosticians inject discs with medication to see if it elicited pain, but we that's really fallen out of favor. So the first five are really what we employ pretty frequently. So let's talk about treatments. There are a lot of different treatments that we utilize. Obviously, medication, anti-inflammatories, muscle relaxant, narcotics for short-term uh, pain, injection therapy. My colleagues, Dr. Kasten, Smith, and Wallen will do various injections to help treat your pain or help diagnose it. Chiropractic treatment, I think, definitely has a role in treating pain, especially acute pain. Sometimes bracing is very effective in patients that may have deformity. Uh, physical therapy, I'm a huge fan of. Anybody who's come and seen me, one of the things I'll ask you the first time I see you, have you had any physical therapy? And if you have not, I will certainly recommend something like that. Acupuncture is a good adjunct. We have acupuncture in the community that we use. Uh, but we're here to talk about surgery. So let's move along. So this is probably the most important slide. And this is really my mantra that I live by when I decide I want to do surgery with patients. First and foremost, you need a clear diagnosis. If you don't know what the problem is, there's no way surgery is going to make a difference. The second thing you need, you really need a, you need to have a mechanical problem. Like a lumbar strain is not a mechanical problem. But a herniated disc or spinal stenosis or scoliosis, that's a mechanical problem. So when you have the first two, then you have your imaging studies, x-rays, MRI, CT scan, whatever, that corroborates the diagnosis and the mechanical problem. On occasion, I'll do confirmatory injections with my colleagues or I'll get an EMG or a nerve conduction velocity study if the diagnosis is still a little bit questionable. And then once you have that together and I decide that surgery is the option for you, then the surgery has to be properly executed. That's kind of a no-brainer, right? And then eventually, once all that's done, if we have the appropriate post-op rehabilitation, surgical results are quite predictable. And I actually put this slide on twice. So that's how important this is. And that's, that is my thinking, my algorithmic thinking when I see patients and I decide if I want to do surgery. So let's talk about some of the myths with surgery. So the first myth is, well, God, I don't want to go see the surgeon because all he wants to do is operate. And that's not true. Dr. Faisu and I are very conservative in our approach. That's why we built the comprehensive spine center. That's why we have our pain team with us. We've got those various treatments available that will solve your problem, physical therapy, injections, et cetera. So we look for ways to not operate, but certainly there are gonna be some times where we see a patient with a severe problem that we know is such a mechanical problem that if we wait, that we risk potential permanent nerve damage, and we will go ahead and recommend surgery the first time we see you. But that's definitely the exception and not the rule. So myth number two, surgery is dangerous and we don't know if it will really work. Well, that's wrong too. I think maybe 30 or 40 years ago, that may have been the case, but we're pretty good at diagnosing patients' problems now. And we've got a myriad of treatment options available. And again, if we go back to those five 
bullet points that I talked about. If you stick to those five bullet points as a surgeon, the results are quite predictable. So you need the right indication. You need a well-executed procedure. You need a proper post-operative plan. And honestly, you know, there may be surgeons out there that may do a little bit of spine, maybe foot and ankle, maybe a knee replacement or hip replacement. But that's why our organization, DOC, has such subspecialists, because you really want to go to someone who does that all the time. And spine more than anything, you really want to go to a surgeon that has pretty much exclusively their practice as being spine surgery. So myth number three. If you have hardware in your neck or back, you can't have an MRI. That's not true. In fact, we've got a lot of sequences that allow you to get really good MRIs and not have the metal distort the picture. Screws, plates, rods, and cages that are used routinely in spinal surgery do not migrate in an MRI. The MRI machines are not now much more sophisticated, and they actually provide what's called a MARS sequence, which is a metal artifact reduction sequence that allows you to see things better. There are exceptions if you have aneurysm clips, maybe some pacemakers, shrapnel, maybe cochlear implants I heard may not be MRI compatible. There are exceptions, but for the most part, just because you have metal in your body, even a hip or knee replacement, doesn't mean that you can't have an MRI. Myth number four, you can't play tennis. Mr. Golf, after back or neck surgery, especially if you have screws or a fusion, I think probably everybody on this Zoom call has heard of Tiger Woods, right? Tiger Woods had three low back surgeries and then finally had an L5-S1 anterior lumbar fusion. So we had L5 fused to S1 and a year later he won the Masters. So absolutely, you can have, you can play tennis or golf after back or neck surgery as long as everything is healed appropriately, you go through the proper rehab and your surgeon clears you to do so. Myth number five, surgery requires several days in the hospital and a long recovery. That's pretty infrequent. I will show you one example where that may be the case, but a lot of what we do requires smaller incisions, are relatively minimally invasive with a short recovery and a short hospital stay. So again, many of our surgeries are minimally invasive, but ultimately you can't do a small surgery if you need a big surgery. If someone has a multi-level problem in their spine, doing a single level, problem, single level surgery will not solve that problem. But having said that, about 40 to 50% of what I do now is either outpatient or overnight. I'm doing more and more surgeries at our new surgery center at the Desert Orthopedic Center building. And I'm sure over time, I'll probably do more and more. So when we talk about surgery, what do we do? Well, as complicated as spine surgery is, there are only two things we really do. We decompress tension nerves and or stabilize or replace painful spinal segments. It sounds pretty simple, and at least at the you know, 50,000 view, the 50,000 foot view, it is pretty simple, but it gets much more complicated when you start to review MRIs and you talk to patients and you correlate the symptoms with the MRI findings, et cetera. So the approach is we have, well, we've got a lot of different ways to skin a cat. We can approach the spine through the front, through the back, and even through the side, and I'll give examples or indications when knees work the best. Generally, it's best to approach the problem directly. For example, if the pathology pinching a nerve is in the front, you generally want to go through the front of the body. Likewise, if it's in the back, you want to go through the back. There are exceptions, however. You can do minimally invasive surgery, and you can find a way to achieve the desired goal by indirectly solving a problem. And I'll give you an example of that as well. So generally, if you're coming in, you have back pain only. That generally indicates that there is a painful segment that's causing pain, whether the segment is unstable or it's worn out, like a degenerated disc or an arthritic facet joint. And typically those surgeries require either replacing or, or stabilizing or fusing that potential uh, painful, painful segment. Leg pain in and of itself generally lends itself to just doing a decompression. And that basically a decompression refers to removing bone or soft tissue or disc material that's pinching the nerve. And that's very, very effective and doesn't require putting in screws or rods or anything of that sort. It's just simply removing the offending structure to allow the nerve to no longer be pinched, alleviating pain in the neck or uh, excuse me, the arm or the leg. There are times, however, where leg pain in and of itself is not necessarily due to a pinched nerve, but due to an unstable motion segment. And in that instance, 
it's better to stabilize the motion segment because if this motion segment is not stabilized, it can result in nerve injury. And then there are instances where patients who have leg pain need both. They need not only the pressure taken off the lumbar spine or the cervical spine, but they need a stabilization procedure to prevent any abnormal motion. So getting into some specifics, degenerative scoliosis, everybody knows what scoliosis is, a curvature in the spine. Uh, you know, a lot of times it's picked up adolescent, as an adolescent, but most commonly scoliosis occurs during your lifetime as you age. A lot of times you may have a small curve when you're done with your adolescent years, and then as you get older, you develop degeneration across your back, and it may lead to a scoliosis. It is a more complex problem. It generally means a more complex surgical solution. There are a lot of techniques available to help treat degenerative scoliosis, but they are generally longer surgeries with a longer recovery time. This is an example of a patient that saw me who I saw for several years who developed this very large curve in her back, uh, failed physical therapy injections, began to develop a lot of leg pain as well. Her MRI showed pretty severe stenosis along the lower part of that curve. And after I talked to her about risks and benefits and what a typical post-op course would uh, be for her, she opted to have surgery. And this is the final product of the surgery. So what I did with her, I went in through the front of the spine. Let me see if I can find my pointer here. And I don't know if the pointer projects that well, but at the very bottom of the this long uh, metallic construct, I put in a couple of cages into the disc space at L4-5 and L5-S1 first to provide a nice platform to correct the rest of her spine. Then I went in through the back and I put this construct in which is basically from the 10th thoracic vertebrae all the way down to the pelvis. And I put a couple of screws into the pelvis to help stabilize the spine. Big surgery, probably took me about seven or eight hours to complete it. Took her about six months to a year to recover. But again, it's, it's a big problem. And with bigger problems, they do require bigger surgeries and longer recovery time. But that's definitely not all that common. But what is common is spinal stenosis. I gave you the scenario of the patient that walks around Costco that has to lean over to alleviate the pain in the back and legs. It's probably the most single common thing that I treat surgically, but the complexity varies. It could be a single level. It could be multiple levels. It could be right in the middle of the spine. It could be just off the midline. It could be all the way out, even outside the actual spinal canal itself. But we have new techniques to minimize recovery and hospital stay. Here's an example of what spinal stenosis looks like. This is called a T2 sagittal image. Sagittal refers to the fact that to the left is the belly, to the right is the back, and then you're basically slicing through the spine. And right up at where my pointer is, hopefully you can see that, that's a relatively normal caliber for the nerves. But when you come down and you see this hour, hourglass constriction at L3, L4, that's what spinal stenosis looks like. So this patient presented to me after having epidurals, physical therapy, et cetera, with back pain, bilateral leg pain, couldn't walk very far, had to lean over, sit down to help alleviate his symptoms. But the other thing this patient has is a little bit of a step off here. The very back of L3, where my pointer is, does not line up with the back of L4. So this patient started to develop some mechanical instability, but wasn't grossly unstable at that segment. So his options included doing a simple decompression only where you remove this soft tissue and bone to decompress the nerves, doing a fusion to stabilize the spine or find, finding something in between. And after I talked to him about potential risks and benefits, we did something in between. So I took the pressure off the nerves, which is part of the surgery, but I also put this device in. This device is called a Coflex interlaminar spacer. It is a device that helps stabilize the segment, but it doesn't fuse it. So this device is kind of an in-between device that my partner and I have utilized in selected cases and it works very, very well. And this patient went home the same day. So it was, a, it was an outpatient procedure. What about cervical spinal surgery, which is really a passion for me. Uh, I, I love doing cervical spinal surgery. I think it's very elegant. The recovery is shorter than the, some of the lumbar spine that we do. It's done through the front of the neck. Again, most of the pathology is in front of the spinal cord. So the best way to approach is to go through the front of the neck. After these surgeries are done, I generally put my patients in a cervical collar. Depending on the number of levels that need to be treated, it can be a soft cervical collar for three weeks or a hard cervical collar for six weeks. Very small incisions in the vast majority of these procedures. 
So here's an example of a patient that came to see me that had pain in her neck going into her left arm, had failed physical therapy, uh, injections, et cetera. And what you're seeing here again is a sagittal image. The front of the neck is to the left, the back of the neck is to the right, and this middle structure that looks like this black tube coming down here is the spinal cord. And then where my pointer is are bone spurs that are pinching the nerves. So this patient was an, an excellent candidate to have a two-level cervical discectomy and fusion performed. That surgery took me an hour and a half. I do these as an outpatient now. And here's her finished product. So what I did is I removed the bone spurs. They are completely gone. I put in these cages that are have these markers on them and they're packed with bone and then put a cervical plate over the top to hold everything in place. The, the Probably the biggest issue that patients have after neck surgery is they have some difficulty swallowing and that difficulty can last a week. It can last several weeks. It's really hard to predict, but generally the more extensive the surgery, the more difficulty with the immediate post-op swallowing, but it does resolve over time. What about cervical disc replacement? We were part of a clinical study that started in 2005. It took forever to collect all the data and finally get it to the FDA, but it was approved, I think, in 2016. Most insurance insurances will cover it, but as opposed to what my partners do where they do hip and knee replacement, it's really best in patients have minimal arthritis, and it is an outpatient procedure. I'm going to show you some pictures from surgeries that we did when we were doing the clinical study. So you can actually look down at the very bottom of this x-ray image here, and you can see this was back in December 2007, so that's how long ago it was when we were doing the research project. And what you do when you when patients come in, they're a candidate for disc replacement, you get a couple of uh, x-ray images before you start to make sure the neck is perfectly oriented. And then you do your exposure, then you do your discectomy, and once the discectomy is done, you go ahead and size the proper or figure out what the best size for the prosthesis is. This is called a parallel distractor. That's put in the disc space. These pins hold the bones apart while the discectomy is done. And then the, the area that's pinching the nerve way back where my pointer is, that disc material or bone spur is removed. Here's an intraoperative x-ray. So what you're looking at, this little rectangle that I'm drawing is actually the area where the disc used to be. And the shiny white material is actually the covering over the spinal cord. And this is an intraoperative picture of the same patient. And then here's a final picture showing what the device looks like. So the prosthesis is made of titanium and it has titanium end plates. And the middle is not hollow. There's actually a piece of plastic that allows the device to move and allows it to bend and translate. My, it's a great surgery. If I needed to have neck surgery done and I was a candidate for a disc replacement with, and met all the proper criteria, I would have it done. And this is what the device looks like from the front. And this lady, I've still seen 10, 15 years after the fact. One of the things we did before we submitted to the FDA, we actually collected data, 10-year data on our patients. So it was incredible having patients come back who'd even left the community but came back for the study I enjoyed seeing them again, talking to them about their lives or whatever, but also getting x-rays and, and seeing how they're doing. And it's uh, stood the test of time. What about herniated discs? That's a low back problem. It's very common. It basically refers to a herniation of the area called the nucleus propulsus. Uh, let me get my pointer working again here. Uh, and when herniate, when discs herniate, they can pinch the nerve and cause leg pain or sciatica. Here's an image again, a sagittal T2 weighted image. What my pointer is pointing to is this black structure here at the very bottom. That's a herniated disc. This is the spinal canal and that herniation is pinching the nerve. Typically, you'll get pain only in one leg with a herniated disc as opposed to stenosis, which oftentimes can give you pain in both legs. It requires a one inch incision, 30 to 45 minute operation. It's an outpatient procedure. And my protocol is I really don't want you to do a lot of heavy lifting, bending, or twisting for three weeks, then slowly allow you to increase your activities. In it. But at six weeks, you can go out and do anything you want. What about a lateral fusion? I mentioned to you that we can actually address spinal pathology going through the side of the spine. That's what this is called. It's called an x lift or lateral fusion. It is a very, very useful technique to address disc or nerve problems between L2 and L5 in the lumbar spine. It requires a very small incision. It's a very useful in revision cases where you do not want to go through 
previously area previous areas of the spine that have been operated on that have scar. And it's also helpful in scoliosis surgery. So when I'm determining whether someone is a good candidate for a lateral fusion, I'm gonna look at their cross-sectional anatomy. So this is a slice taken through someone's midsection. The belly is up in the top, the back is in the bottom, the right side is to the left and the left side is to the right. And what I'm looking for specifically to see where the organs are, if there's a kidney in the way, but I'm also looking at these muscles right here that look like they're rectangular. That is called your iliopsoas muscle. And I wanna see what the iliopsoas muscle likes and what it looks like. And I wanna see if there's any infiltration of nerve material near the anterior or front of that iliopsoas muscle. And depending on where the, what's, what we call the neurovascular bundle is located, that will help dictate whether I come in on the left side or the right side, but the scoliosis and some other factors play into it as well. So here's an example of a patient who came to me, has a lot of arthritis in his back, but I had no idea where his back pain was coming from. It's almost a crap sheet. You can throw a dartboard on his back because he had arthritis all the way up and down his back. But what I did do is I ordered that SPEC scan. A SPEC scan is a combination CT scan, bone scan, and it's revolutionized our ability to determine where a patient's back pain is coming from. This is what a SPEC scan looks like. So a SPEC scan is a bone scan, CT scan combination. And what I tell my patients is I'm looking for a hot spot. I wanna know where your pain's coming from. And oftentimes when you see a hot spot like this, and that's across the L45 disc space, and it localizes at the same level or roughly the same level where the patient is describing the pain and there's no other hot spot, there's a good chance that that's gonna be the source of pain. And this patient's anatomy actually lended itself to do the lateral fusion. So the incision's actually made right above the pelvic region and below the rib cage. And again, it's a very small incision, minimally invasive technique, and allows me to do something like this, where I basically put this cage in that has these markers packed with bone, and that disc that was really collapsed is now, re the height is recreated and that segment is stabilized. And this patient felt great by the time they left the hospital. These surgeries, I usually have my patients stay overnight. So future directions. We just completed another FDA study uh, to actually replace the lumbar facet joints. The company is called Premia Spine. We've submitted our data to the FDA. We're waiting for the FDA to approve it is a wonderful alternative to lumbar fusion in patients who have spinal stenosis and have an entity called spondylolisthesis where the bones don't quite line up. Similar to what I showed you with that one patient who underwent the COFLEX procedure. Uh, we have more than preliminary results now. We've got some excellent three and four year data. It, again, it's an option to lumbar fusion. It maintains motion. The one downside is the way the device is currently designed. It's a single level implant only. And honestly, and we've got maybe five year data. There's more data over in Europe, but to really see if this is going to be as beneficial as we think, we need long-term follow-up, just like we've had for the cervical disc replacement. So in summary, low back pain and neck pain are extremely common. Four out of five people are gonna develop it to the point where they're gonna seek care. Almost everyone will get it at some point during their lifetime. Sometimes it can be associated with leg pain or arm pain, numbness or weakness. But the take home message is the majority of patients who have uncomplicated back pain will recover within six weeks. So if you're out on the golf course, you hit a bad shot, your back gets, th you throw your back out. Don't feel that you've got to get a referral to me or my spinal surgery partner and see us within two weeks. Chances are you're gonna get better on your own anyway. We do have a variety of treatment options available to treat your back pain and in selected patients, surgery can be very effective. Again, going back to my mantra, and this is again, one of the most important things that you can take home tonight is that I'm looking for a clear diagnosis, a mechanical problem, the corroborating imaging studies, injections or EMGs. And once I have that and we decide what the best treatment plan for you, I will certainly do and I will properly execute that surgery because I have a passion for doing this. I've been doing it for 20 years and we'll make sure we come up with the appropriate post-op rehabilitation. Some surgeries I do require really no post-op rehabilitation. Some surgeries I do require more extensive rehabilitation and we tackle that on a case-by-case -case basis. 
So future directions of really encouraging diagnostic and treatment modalities. There is a role with biologics and synthetics eventually to help treat uh, spinal disease. The approach will always be through a multidisciplinary perspective. That is the best way to take care of patients. We have new technology, just like I demonstrated with the facet joint replacement. Ultimately, we want to get you back on the tennis court and certainly the pickleball court or on the golf course to make sure that uh, you really get back to enjoying your life and we can get you back to all the activities of daily living that you were missing. So I'd like to thank you and uh, I'll turn it over to Brett and we can field some questions. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Tarnia. Um, yeah, at this point, I don't have anything in the chat, so let's open it up and be courteous of each other. So if you would like to unmute yourself and then ask a question, please do so. I have a question. Yes, please go All ahead. right. I have multiple sclerosis, spinal stenosis, and um, herniated disc. And um, I see that there's two different kinds of surgeons. There's orthopedic, and there's also neurosurgeon. So for someone like me with neurological problems, who would be the surgeon of choice for me? Well, a good question. Uh, it really, what, what you, going back to what I mentioned about surgery, you really want to go to someone who does spinal surgery as their career. I, I would tell you probably 30 year, years ago, there was a huge dichotomy in the training programs. Neurosurgery were basically nerve guys and orthopedic guys were bone guys. But now with the orthopedic and neurosurgical training programs, there's really tremendous crossover. So I would tell you the, the most important thing for you to do is find someone that you feel comfortable with that has a good reputation and does a lot of what your problem is. That is the most important thing. All right, thank you very much. You bet. All right, thank you for that question. Uh, let's go on to the next person. Please unmute yourself and ask a question of the doctor. Uh, Dr. Tavernia, I have spinal lowest thesis. And I've had lots of treatment. In fact, um, just today, Dr. Wong gave me an epidural uh, of a steroid. And I <clears throat> have no idea how it's working, but I have always been really fit. But when I turned 70, it was like kaboom. All of a sudden, my bad back got severely worse. So um, about how long <laughs> uh, after I have this epidural, before I come and see you, because this has been going on now for about uh, a year for me. And I've done, um, oh, months and months of PT, uh, lots and lots, and I've been, I've been an exerciser and I've done stretching my entire life, yoga, before I see you. Well, first of all, I think one of the things that you've done that's fantastic is you are, and I yeah. think that's kept you probably out of Dr. Wong's office for years until just yes. recently. That's what he uh, said. Yeah, no doubt about it. And I can't, I, I cannot emphasize the importance of fitness for your yeah. back. Uh, but uh, going back to your question about the epidural, uh, it could take a week to two weeks for the epidural to reach its maximum benefit. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not unusual to want to have a second epidural done. But I can tell you, if the first two epidurals do not give you long-term relief, a third will not. That's been my experience. Oh, good to but, know. Thank you. But I would certainly wait at least two or three weeks to see if the epidural works. I'm sure you'll probably have a follow-up with Dr. Wong. Yeah. And if that doesn't work, uh, then it would be a time to come and, and consult with me. And we may decide that surgery is not the best thing for you. Maybe there are other options available. But I think the, the best way to manage your pain right now is to work with Dr. Wong. And if that doesn't get you where you need to be, then you can come see me. Great. Thank you. And thank you for this lecture. It's been really helpful. Learned lots of stuff. My pleasure. All right, great questions. Please uh, go on to the next. Who would like to ask a question? Uh, Dr. Tahernia, I have seen you before and I have, uh, you referred me to, um, I had some um, numbness in my hand. So I was, uh, you sent me for some EMG tests and now I have been seeing Dr. Uh, Stephen O'Connell mm -hmm. and I am scheduled for um, surgery uh, in a couple of weeks for a carpal tunnel um, because the injection of cortisone did did not affect anything. Uh, can you uh, elaborate a little bit more about hand uh, numbness 
Uh, your presentation was more on uh, back uh, pain and leg pain. Uh, please, can you do that for me? Sure, of course, yeah. Uh, it, it, there, there's significant crossover, much more in the upper extremities and the lower extremities between my upper extremity partners and myself. Uh, certainly hand numbness could be indicative of something coming from the cervical spine, but it's a little unusual if it's an isolated phenomenon and it's only unilateral to be coming from the cervical spine. So in your case, something like an EMG nerve conduction velocity study, which is that neurodiagnostic, neurodiagnostic study probably helped with your diagnosis. Yes. And, and then obviously you know, it came back with carpal tunnel and carpal tunnel typically classically involved the thumb index long and ring fingers can be treated with injections with wrist splinting, but eventually may need to be released as well. Uh, but typically when I see patients who have unilateral hand numbness only, it is somewhat unusual that that is a cervical spinal phenomenon. With the exception of patients that come and see me and both hands are numb, they've lost dexterity, their penmanship's getting worse, they have a tendency to drop objects and or they feel unsteady when they walk. If that constellation is presented to me, the first thing I'm thinking about is pressure on your cervical spinal cord. Because cervical spinal cord compression doesn't cause pain, it's a functional problem. And I can't tell you how many times patients have come and seen me and I've diagnosed it and they've been told by maybe their spouse or maybe their primary care physician, oh, you're just getting older, you know, you're gonna lose dexterity as you get older. And you know, that's probably true in the vast majority of cases, but there are certainly a lot of cases that I see where that's not the case. And if I ask you those five questions and you're five for five on the yes meter for me, then I'm thinking cervical spinal cord compression and I'm gonna get an MRI to rule that out. All right, great question. We had another person unmuted. Feel free to ask the question to the doctor. My question is, um, I have spinal stenosis, and I'm wondering how you get in the queue to get through all these tests, et cetera, that you've been talking about. Uh, question for you, uh, how do you know you have spinal stenosis? Have you had an MRI or, or any imaging study? Yes, I have an MRI. Uh, one okay. of the problems, I'm a Canadian, and I okay. uh, have a doctor down here for referrals. And you would want to come see me to evaluate you, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, just call call the office, let them know that you attended the lecture and we'll work we'll, we will work magic to get you in. How's that? Okay, thank you very much. You got it. And on that, uh, we will have a couple more questions in a second, but on that question that just came up, um, when I send the recording out to everybody within the week, I will also um, send the contact information for the doctor's office so that you can you know access that. Thank right. you. You bet. Um, we do have a question in the chat. It says, could you explain the difference between an epidural via fluoroscopy and CT guided nerve root block? Well, I'm not too familiar with the CT guided ner nerve block, but I can tell you in terms of epidurals, there are different epidurals that can be done. And my partners use fluoroscopy. That's really the standard of care. And the, the two different kinds of epidurals, one is called interlaminar which is done from the back, but it's not directly in the midline, it's just off the midline. And then there are transforaminal epidurals that are done at a much steeper angle from the side, targeting one particular nerve root. My preference and what I think is most effective are the transforaminal epidurals because they target one particular nerve root. And even as important for me, as I mentioned to you that I use confirmatory injections with my diagnoses, if my pain colleagues target one nerve and they inject that nerve and sometimes it may recreate your pain, I want to know that. For the first six to eight hours after the injection, if that nerve is causing your pain, you should feel pretty good because it's almost like numbing up a bad tooth because there's anesthetic with the steroid. And then the steroid itself will hopefully give you long-term relief. So those are the two different kinds of epidurals. My colleagues do not use CT guidance. They don't need to. They're, they're incredibly talented at what they do with fluoroscopy. And those are the two general types of epidurals that they do. Hopefully that answers your question. Sorry about that. All right, uh, feel free to unmute and ask some more questions to the doctor. There was a lot of information provided, so feel free to uh, think back and take a minute and ask a question. Uh, 
Okay, another question. So today when I had my epidural from Dr. Wong, it sounds like I had a transperennial one. Mm -hmm. That's probably right. Yeah, because it really, when he hit that nerve, it was like, <laughs> he said it was, it feel like a bee sting. And I said, well, that bee has big teeth because it really, it got it down. So did, did it recreate your leg pain? Mm -hmm. Yes, but, yeah. only, yeah. but only for, for maybe 30 seconds at the most. Well, that's perfect because he, he clearly hit the, what we say, the right spot. Yeah. And then yeah, for okay. the first six to eight hours after the injection, how did your leg feel? I, uh, let's see. Well, I took a nap when I got home. Fair, fair um, enough. <laughs> and so I got up in time for your lecture. But um, right now, it feels pretty good, actually. And I don't yep. know if it's because of that or if it's because maybe um, the painkiller has not worn off. Yeah, it's, it's probably the anesthetic mm -hmm. that's giving you that immediate relief and in, in the first day of relief. And mm -hmm. then we'll just have to see if the steroid kicks in and gives you long-term relief. Well, that's good to know. Okay, thank you again. My pleasure. I have another question, if that's okay. Sure. I just want to get this straight that I've had one epidural and it worked for about two and a half weeks. Okay. And then I just had another one and I was expecting I would feel better two days after. But now today you were saying you need to wait one or two weeks. Yeah, I and would tell you probably one to two weeks to see the full effect of the epidural. Okay. Uh, and, and I would also say, like I mentioned previously, typically, if you have two epidurals that don't give you long-term relief, it is, I wouldn't say impossible, but it's pretty unlikely that a third is going to magically knock out that pain. Okay, that was part of my question, too. I've got people, friends, family members as well, who go and get epidurals maybe every three months, every six months, you know, and they've been doing this for a long time. Sure. So what? What do you, what's to say about that? Well, it, it really an depends. Opinion? Well, it, it, it depends on what kind of epidural. Maybe it's in a different location in the spine. Maybe one is done at L4-5, another one's done at L5-S1. Okay. Maybe they're different injections and maybe they're, they're trigger point injections. So I think sometimes there may be a little bit of loss to translation, lost in translation to exactly what kind of injection your family members had. Because um, not, not every injection is the same. I can tell you that for sure. You know, an intralaminar epidural is different than a transforaminal epidural, which is different than a trigger point injection, oh. which is different than a facet joint injection. So they may be having injections done, but different structures may be injected at different times. Okay. All right, then. Makes more sense to me then. Thank you. You bet. Great questions. Uh, next, anyone else with a question? Please unmute. There we go. Feel free to ask the question. I saw someone unmute. All right. Well, feel free to ask a question, anyone. Feel free to unmute and um, we'll get the questions answered for you. There we go. Um, I'm back again, the Canadian. Um, it seems to me it's a progression of physical therapy, maybe um, epidural, maybe a minor operation, and then the, the uh, major operation. Is that correct? Well, it, it, it's uh, hard, hard to give you that answer without knowing exactly what your problem is. I mean, there, there are some surgeries that I do that are very simple that take 30 to 45 minutes, and then uh, I send my patients on their merry way, I don't see them again. Uh, there are some instances where I do a surgery, and that surgery doesn't necessarily permanently fix that particular segment. For example, if I do a decompression, but I don't fuse a segment, and that segment over your lifetime could become unstable and may need a second procedure, I guess that's what you're referring to. Uh, and, and it's an art. I mean, having been in practice for 20 years, I mean, every patient is a little different. And I look at my MRI, I look at my x-rays, I look at all my imaging studies. We talk about what we're trying to accomplish, talk about whether we want to do something that's more aggressive or less aggressive. Uh, so it's, it's, it's an art. And, uh, you know, over 20 years, you know, I've, I've done as good as I can to provide the best kind of surgery for each patient. 
And boy, I'll tell you, you know, no, no one's perfect. You know, when you've been doing this for 20 years, you have a lot of successes. You have a couple of cases, especially early on in your career, where you think back and you say, hmm, maybe I should have done something different because that patient didn't get the ultimate result they wanted or needed a second surgery or whatever. Uh, but, uh, you know, over 20 years, uh, it's a lot of experience that I draw back on. Thank you. You bet. All right. Next question, please. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Oh, okay, good. Uh, I've uh, had the the uh, pleasure of visiting with uh, Kurt Edley at the end of December, and uh, and I have a, uh, a an appointment uh, with uh, Dr. Tahernia on Wednesday morning, uh, and it is regarding my uh, spinal stenosis. Uh, They've sent me for uh, uh, x-rays, which they did for us. And also, they uh, sent me for uh, an MRI, and I have that as well. But my, my question is, uh, I had several questions, and some of them you've already uh, uh, answered. But one thing that uh, Kurt mentioned was uh, 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 injections uh, versus surgery, and uh, this is something that your uh, your examination of my MRI will probably tell us, uh, but uh, is it is it an injection uh, or is it quite often uh, uh, sufficient uh, or several injections? Injections? Yeah, I mean it, it. It really depends on what your MRI shows me. I mean, again, I've got to look at your pain diagram, examine you, look at the MRI, see how long you had your symptoms. I can tell you if if someone comes into me and they've had symptoms that have been present for three years, and they've been through physical therapy, they've done a lot of conservative treatment short of an injection, and their MRI shows absolutely severe stenosis, then it's a mechanical problem. So that scenario, injections are less likely to be beneficial. But if someone comes into me and has sciatic pain and their MRI doesn't look all that bad, maybe moderate narrowing, uh, that's that patient will probably do better with an injection. So a lot of it depends on the chronicity and the severity of the symptoms and the imaging studies. So I kind of correlate all those three things and I, I put all that information together to determine if I think injections are gonna work or not. Right, and uh, we're from uh, Canada as well. Uh, and uh, uh, the timing is always an issue for us. Uh, sure. The, the, uh, the injections I think Kurt mentioned were over like a two month period maybe, if that's what it took. Yeah, we would. Uh, and, we'll 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 talk about that when you come in and see me. I'll have you fill out my pain diagram again because I love that pain diagram, and then figure out exactly what is wrong. If it's a pinched nerve, if it's something else, and we'll come up with a good treatment plan for you. Right. Okay. Well, any anyways, uh, this has been a very informative uh, little uh, little uh, uh, Zoom meeting, and uh, I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. You bet. I, I'm looking forward to it as well. All right, Thank you. great. We have a, someone else who unmuted. Feel free to ask the question if you have one. No. Someone on an iPhone keeps unmuting, but I do have one in the chat. We'll ask that first and think about it. I have spinal arthritis and it affects my feet. Uh, my metatarsals have caused me to be unstable in walking and some pain in the toes and arches. Is toe surgery difficult? Is toe surgery difficult? Well, I definitely out of my realm of expertise, I <laughs> would probably have you see you know, Dr. Johnson or Dr. Frischer and they can tell you exactly what uh, toe surgery involves. Great, thank you. All right, folks, we're getting near the end, but is there any um, final questions that anyone would like to ask? Unmute yourself, there we go, someone. You are unmuting, but we're not hearing you if you are speaking, just as a reference. And we do have another question. A friend mentioned a procedure called LINQ. Do you know what that is and can you explain it? Uh, no, I'm not familiar with it. Certainly if it was something that was in my world of spine surgery, I would know about it. Maybe it's some minimally invasive pain management procedure, but I'm not familiar with it. Great, thank you. All right. Any last question for the doctor? 
Hi, hi there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Uh, hi there. Uh, I I have lower back difficulties. Uh, I've had an MRI done, and they found that on my right side and lower back, there's it's there's some calcification happening, and it, they speak of a burn of a of a spur that it that at times impinges on on the nerve. Uh, I do physiotherapy. I went to the phys uh, and I do a lot of exercise. exercises to try to keep that at bay. Um, is there is there a relatively simple procedure to correct some of this to uh, take that pressure that bone spur away so that it's not impinging on the nerve? Well, I, it really depends on whether you're getting any leg pain with that pinched nerve. If you're not getting any leg pain, it's only back pain. Then we don't know yet if that pinch if that bone spur is causing your pain. So we would probably need some more diagnostics to determine that. But if you had a bone spur that was pinching a nerve and you had classic nerve pain in that particular distribution of that nerve and epidurals didn't work and there was not a, mechanical a mechanically unstable segment, then a simple procedure may very well work for you. Okay, well, okay, thank you. I don't, have the, uh, I don't have the pain running down my leg. Uh, it just it runs around the around the, in the in the hip in the hip joint mostly, and it interferes with um, if I want to do some of the things like golfing. It does or twisting motion, and mm -hmm. the exercise seem to keep that at bay it, to some extent. Perfect. I would keep on exercising. That's crucially important. Combination of some aerobic conditioning and core strengthening. Okay. Thank you. You bet. All right. Another question. When doing spinal surgery. How much of a factor is osteoporosis? Uh, it really depends on what you're doing. Uh, if you're doing a simple decompression where you are removing bone or soft tissue to unpinch a nerve, osteoporosis is not that big a deal. But if you need to put in hardware to stabilize the spine, it can be a big deal, uh, especially if you're severely osteoporotic. Uh, there are DEXA scans that we can obtain to determine how bad your bone quality is. We actually have software built into the Eisner CT scanners that can give us uh, a sense of how bad your osteoporosis is. But we also have techniques to help deal with osteoporotic bone. Some of the hardware I use is coated with hydroxyapatite and have fenestrations to help actually with the purchase in bone that is osteopenic or osteoporotic. So there, there's new technology to help deal with that. And there's also uh, the different medications you can take to deal with osteoporosis too. Uh, the one that actually builds bone is called teriparatide or Forteo. A lot of the other medications help decrease the, the, the severity of bone loss, but Forteo has been proven to actually build bone quality. Uh, and I, there are a couple of instances where I've had patients that have seen me, had poor bone quality, didn't have to have anything done emergently. And I have the primary care physician put them on Forteo to increase their bone quality before we did surgery, just to decrease the likelihood of any, having any type of hardware complications. All right. Can I ask a question? Please, go ahead. Uh, this, I, I talked to you earlier. Uh, I'm a Canadian and uh, come down, I have an MRI taken of, of my back difficulty. I talked about that in props A's, the spur that was uh, putting pressure on. Uh, can you give me, are the, an examination and uh, say some surgery on a back, you said it might, could be simple. Can you give me some uh, kind of a baseball figure of what something like that might cost? You know, Eisenhower, Eisenhower would be able to give you that information better than I would. Uh, they have a Canadian bundle and they have an organization that would be happy to talk to you about that. Uh, I don't set the prices, Eisenhower does because they have the Canadian bundle. And I'm sure Brett could probably give you some information to, and you can find that out. Or my office manager, if and when that becomes an option for you, can connect you to Eisenhower to give you that Canadian bundle. Okay, thank you for that. You bet. And on that question, I just put um, in the chat, um, if you pull it up, my email address and my name. So feel free to email me and then I can connect you with our insurance side of the house as well as our Canadian team that works directly with our Canadian bundle. Okay, I knew that. I've just taken, I've got that. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect, you bet. I have a question? Yes, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Deherdia. Um, Actually, I'm 
sitting here with my husband. He's the Bruce G. I'm Carolyn. And um, I had surgery with you about eight years ago and on my L4-5, and it was very effective. I've been having problems at L3-4, and I've been seeing Dr. Wong for about six months. Um, he um, and I don't, you know, I won't go into all my, my treatment. My question to you is, um, cause I did have the disectomy infusion with you, um, in 2015. Um, and I know that when you have surgeries, it puts stress on the other discs. So my question to you is, you know, how, how, um, common is it? to require surgery as you go up or down on your levels of your spine. I do have spondylolisthesis. I have, you know, some herniation. I have some curvature now of my spine. Um, and I've also had 20 years ago, I had cervical fusion to C4 to C7. So okay. I've had quite a bit of work done on my spine, but I've been active. Um, I'm a retired nurse, so I, you know, was using my spine quite a bit for many sure. years. Um, so like I said, I am seeing Dr. Wong. In fact, I have an appointment with him next week, but it's, you know, it's good to see you and, and hear your lectures and see now that even some newer procedures are being done. For sure. So your question about having adjacent segments give you right. problems in the future. Well, yeah, certainly when you think about the spine biomechanically, whether it's the cervical or the lumbar spine, I mean, you have five segments in the lumbar spine that's supposed to work. And if you remove one of them, then you have four that do the work of five. Uh -huh. So certainly logistically, it makes sense that those may see a little bit more wear and tear. Statistically, and we've done meta-analyses on these uh, in the lumbar spine, maybe not so much the cervical spine, but there is about a two to three percent per year incidence of having adjacent segment disease severe enough that treatment will be required. So, and that seems to be across the board, regardless of what we try to do. I mean, now there's certain procedures and certain levels that are more prone to have breakdown above or below, if you will. For example, the more levels you have, you have fewer segments actually do the work, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a single level lumbar fusion, you've got four segments left. If you have a three-level lumbar fusion, you have two segments left. So that could cause a little bit more of accelerated wear. We've seen that one of the things I described was that lateral fusion coming in through the side of the spine. It seems that our literature is indicating that adjacent segment disease is much less frequent with that particular type of technique. But yeah, it is one of the things that, that we are actively investigating. How can we fix a problem, especially if it requires immobilizing a segment without recreating one 20 years down the road. And uh, I can tell you, if you you talk to 10 well-trained spine surgeons across the country, they will tell you that they're trying to figure that out too. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You bet. All right, everyone. That was a perfect final question. And um, um, thank you, Dr. Tahernia, and thank you everyone for participating tonight. As mentioned, this will be recorded. I mean, this is recorded. It will be edited in the next week. Um, we'll get it out for approval and then we'll get it off to everybody. And uh, with that in mind, Dr. Turner, any last final comments before we adjourn? No, it's a pleasure doing this. I mean, I was giving lectures over at the Annenberg and we did that in person. Uh, you know, this is kind of the new normal sometimes now doing it in a Zoom fashion. I actually told Brett it'd be great if I can do a combination where I have people come to the Annenberg and still have people Zoom, it'd be great. Uh, because I like to see people. I mean, I'm in the I'm in the people business, right? So it's nice to see faces and uh, and and communicate that way and uh, bond with my patients, like I've been doing for the last 20 years. All right, everyone, be safe and thank you for joining us. All right, thank you.